also to those uh, listening in afterwards. Um, I'm Nikolina Biškic and uh, currently I work as a regulatory affairs manager in Switzerland. I will be the chair of the webinar. Um, I'd also like to warmly uh, welcome our guest speakers today, whom we'll, uh, we will shortly introduce. Um, we are pleased to be delivering this webinar today on the topic uh, particle size measurement and its impact on uh, drug bioavailability. Um, some of the uh, main objectives of the webinar uh, are to understand how pharmaceutical companies uh, can measure particle size and achieve a consistent contact uh, uniformity and better flowability. Also to define the control uh, particle size distribution for pharmaceutical drug development, to identify the most important parameters for the drug formulation and bioavailability, to discuss the impact of uh, moisture measurement in process of particle and uh, particle size and density, and to identify the impact of the powder particle size distribution on the quality uh, and performance with which it affects uh, drug efficacy, safety, and uh, manufacturability. Uh, please note that this event is uh, live streamed on the FIPS YouTube channel. Uh, it will also be recorded and the recording will be available at uh, events.fip.org. Uh, to all those listening, uh, please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A box uh, and uh, we will be answering the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm now uh, also pleased to be introducing uh, my co-moderator, uh, Butchra Mehta, who will uh, introduce herself and the speakers further. Thank you so much, Nicolina. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are joining us from. I would like to warmly welcome our listeners and uh, our panelists in uh, this uh, FIP event. It's my great uh, pleasure to co-moderate with my colleague uh, Colina on the call. So my name is uh, Busha Meda. I am professor of pharmacology in the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy, uh, University Mohammed V uh, at Rabat in Morocco. And uh, I am a fifth member uh, EPS section. Uh, as you know, in the, the FIP, uh, our mission is to support global health uh, by enabling the advancement uh, of pharmaceutical practice uh, sciences and uh, uh, education. So for that, we are pleased to organize uh, this uh, webinar uh, and their uh, FIP. And now it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce our uh, first uh, speaker for, for uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, present Dr. Karim Arif. He is a pharmacist, consultant uh, and formulator at uh, KMC, uh, KMCD Consulting, uh, within 14 years experience in uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, five of them in the Middle East, Africa, Turkey, and the Iran region. Uh, responsible for many, many topics and expertise. I can, uh, I can say technical uh, training on site, uh, formulation of new generic solid, liquid, and semi uh, solid dosage form and DPIs, troubleshooting experts in pharmaceutical film coating, granulation, and tabletting. Uh, he studied this uh, pharmacy in the University of Mohammed V, Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy in Rabat of Morocco and studied the biology, geology in the University of Hassan II Faculty of Sciences in Casablanca, Morocco. Launched some researches in screening and extraction of uh, bioactives from actinomycetes and formulation of insulin tab in tab. So very glad today, Dr. Karim, to welcome you in uh, this webinar. And we are very delighted to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm muted. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to uh, join this webinar to talk a little bit about the particle measurements, uh, particle size measurements and the impact on the uh, bioavailability. Uh, uh, you know, the rate of uh, drug release uh, is closely dependent to the particle size distribution of the drug itself, and it determines uh, the surface area of the solution, and hence it impacts uh, the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of the API. 
So during this presentation, I'm gonna talk uh, very briefly about the particle diameter definition and that methods used to measure the particle size distribution and also a cascade of, uh, of events to uh, introduce the impact of the particle size on the powder blend flowability segregation phenomenon, uniformity, content uniformity, and the relationship. Finally, we will talk about uh, a relationship between bioavailability and particle size distribution. Later on, I'll give the, uh, uh, you know, the second part will be discussed by uh, Dr. Uh, Udo, who will be uh, talking about the moisture content measurements and density, which are closely uh, linked to uh, the particle size. So uh, to everyone handling powders, uh, the particle size is very essential to know. Uh, if you go to EC ICH uh, Q6A, it's considered as a potentially uh, important variable for solid dosage forms, suspensions, uh, emulsions as well. Um, bioavailability is often directly related to particle size distribution because it controls the distribution rate of the drug. It's not a simple task to define a particle if it's not spherical. And uh, rarely they are uh, in a regular shape because the process of crystallization, milling and sieving uh, leads to pro pro produce irregular forms of, of, of uh, particles. Uh, so by knowing uh, uh, the particle di I mean, diameter, we can uh, build uh, um, a database about the particle size distribution which is a number of particles of a certain size in function of uh, the quantity. I mean, uh, it's a number in function of the particle size and we call it frequency of occurrence. Next. Okay. Uh, most methods uh, describe the particle diameters based on uh, an assumption. So no one has a unique or a solo definition of the particle diameter, but it's an assumption. So we consider a particle size as equivalent to a sphere with the same minimum length or a sphere with same maximum length. It could be uh, uh, equivalent to a sphere with the same weight. I prefer to use the word or the term mass, which is more scientific and or volume, or maybe if we can have a, a sphere with the same sedimentation rate, and here we will use the uh, equation of uh, stroke uh, that we'll, uh, we will see it later on to describe uh, velocity of the particle in air or in uh, fluid in general, uh, depending on the particle size and viscosity of the fluid. It could be also um, um, defined as equivalent sphere passing, passing through a sieve aperture or uh, equivalent to a sphere with the same surface area. Next, please. So in general, we have a, a database called particle size distribution, which is a size range of uh, several uh, particle uh, diameters. And we can obtain a histogram like the one you see in, on the screen. Uh, the, uh, from this histogram, we can um, uh, determine uh, some statistical parameters called uh, uh, percentiles values, D10, D50, and D90 uh, in pharmaceutical industry. If you go to the soil uh, uh, science, I mean, uh, in geolo geology, for example, who are uh, specialized in soil analysis, they use D10, D30, D60, and D, D90, I believe. So for pharmaceutical uh, industry, we use these three parameters called uh, uh, percentile values. The histogram, the, the, the shape and of the histogram can give us an idea about the uh, flowability of the powder blend. If it's large, uh, we say that the population is heterogeneous. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, big uh, uh, amount of different populations, which will have an impact on the flowability. As long as it gets narrower, the population is more homogeneous 
uh, with greater flowability, and we have uh, less fines and less cores around the median. However, this is not a standard and universal rule because if we take a very fine particles below 50 micrometers uh, of diameter and we have a narrow histogram, it doesn't really give a good flow of it, just for, for, uh, for your information. But in general, particle size between 50 micrometers to uh, 1200 micrometers could uh, 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 present a, a certain uh, uh, good flow of it especially when the histogram is narrow. We call it large histogram when the D90 divided by D10 is uh, higher than one, and it's narrower, which is the best uh, uh, situation we a formulator is looking for when the D90 divided by D10 is around one. Next, please. Okay, so what, what what does D value means? When we say D10, D50, D, uh, D90, it's uh, 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 the amount of particles uh, of a certain size uh, or especially a percentage of particles uh, of a certain size below which uh, the particle uh, size is uh, below this value. For example, if we say D10, uh, equal uh, five micrometers. That means 10% uh, of our population is below five micrometers. It's D50, for example, equal 150 micrometers means that 50% of uh, the population of the powder blend is below 50 micrometers and etc. for D90. Next, please. In practice, uh, uh, who are uh, working on formulations of tablets, uh, hard capsules, uh, DPIs, dry powder inhalers, suspensions and creams, they are concerned uh, 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 about the particle size specifications. So uh, uh, it is a mandatory parameter that we need to value and qu qu quantify for our next uh, uh, steps in formulation. Next, please. In general, for solid dosage forms, uh, particle size is strongly impacting the specific surface area. Uh, we will uh, talk about it later on. So uh, when you want to increase, uh, especially for uh, poorly soluble APIs, uh, in order to increase the dissolution rate and uh, uh, solubility, we may reduce the particle size. By reducing the particle size by uh, grinding or milling, uh, or micronization process, we increase the area, this powder, the same amount of uh, mass of powder uh, can occupy in space. Uh, so the uh, specific surface area and particle size are inversely proportional. Increasing particle size uh, requires uh, reducing uh, the specific uh, surface area and vice versa. Uh, flowability also is impacted by particle size. So if we have more fines in our blend below 50 micrometers or around 50 micrometers, our powder blend will move slowly, especially when we do transfer of the powder in the hopper, when we want to uh, make tablets or when we want to fill hard capsules or either for uh, oral dosage forms or DPIs or sachet. Uh, it could be a, a, a very a problematic during the transfer, which will have an impact uh, also on the segregation. So segregation is a very natural phenomenon we cannot avoid. In every powder blend, we have this segregation, whatever uh, is the uh, histogram, uh, uh, I mean, shape, we have this phenomenon, but we can reduce it to avoid or to uh, stay away from content uniformity. Uh, again, content uniformity can be affected by particle size distribution uh, because flowability segregation have some, some come uh, as a result, uh, uh, um, a decrease or um, they can impact the content uniformity for tablets uh, uh, or, or when if, whatever uh, unit dosage forms. Uh, both uh, elements, uh, will have uh, uh, directly an impact on bioavailability when the solution rate is impacted 
we'll see, uh, as you can see, there is a, a noise Whitney equation in the bottom of the slide. You can see the cinetic kinetic of uh, 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 this dissolution rate is in function of the letter A. It, A is the specific surface area. When we increase the specific surface area, the dissolution rate increase. That means we decrease the particle size. Uh, having a uh, high or large particle size will also impact the absor absorption behavior in gastrointestinal tractures. So uh, a crystal with higher or with large particle size will take longer time to dissolve and to get absorbed by the uh, gastrointestinal uh, uh, apparatus uh, system. Uh, then we will have uh, we will achieve a C max and T max uh, very uh, slowly, and we will have an impact on the effectiveness of the product. Uh, from the production uh, uh, point of view, having a, a, a large histogram, I mean a large uh, size range will absolutely have an impact on the time of the process, uh, time of the transfer from, as I said, from the hopper to the dies in the tablet press or inside the capsules. Uh, so we are required to uh, make it uh, narrower to improve flowability. Bonding to the moisture, which is also important, having a uh, lower particle size, uh, increase uh, the uh, uh, forces, like uh, Van der Waals uh, forces, electrostatic forces, and uh, bonding to, to the molecule of water. Uh, that's why later on, uh, Dr. Uh, Udo will talk about how we measure moisture because it's important and it's closely linked to the particle size. The shelf life of drug also is impacted by the particle uh, size. So if uh, our product is uh, uh, milled to a certain size, we may expose it to uh, environment and uh, it will be uh, more uh, reactive to uh, oxygen or to the to the light or to the moisture and then stability will be uh, a really uh, important concern for uh, formulator so to these all parameters concern uh, also the excipient not only the api because uh, uh, bioavailability is also linked to the uh, quality of the excipient. So we need to uh, think about these parameters for both drug and excipient. Next slide, please. As I told you uh, about uh, a relationship between the particle size and specific surface area, you can see in the plot by uh, increasing the specific surface area, we decrease uh, the, the particle size. Uh, which uh, requires, um, in, in some cases, not usually, it could require uh, an, uh, an, uh, uh, an increase in the volume. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. And if we increase the specific surface area, we decrease uh, the density and it's an increase in the volume. But it's not the same uh, applicable uh, uh, approach uh, for other type of powders. For, the, for example, in the next slide, you can see that we can increase the density. Please, uh, next slide. OK. So in, in some cases, we can increase the density of the powder by filling the pores with finer particles without changing the volumes. And uh, this is another uh, uh, tool of uh, understanding the particle size distribution of our blend. Next, please. Next. OK. The particle size uh, and flow relationship is uh, uh, also connected because uh, we cannot have a good flow when the particles are almost around 1200 micrometers because there is a mechanical blockage uh, made by the particles. However, when we have uh, particles below 50 micrometers, the van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces get increased and they increase the cohesiveness of the powder and then the flowability will, will get decreased. However, so as a formulator, we should be careful in choosing the size range of our powder blend to uh, have a better flowability. Next, please. Uh, for suspensions and emulsions, 
We are concerned about the particle size uh, uh, for suspensions and the missile size diameter of uh, emulsions. So uh, as a formulator, I have two, uh, two situations here. Either I can uh, use one particle size and then using this uh, mathematic formula, I can decide which viscosity uh, is the best for me to uh, achieve a certain uh, uh, settle velocity by using the stocks low, or I can uh, uh, change the, select the particle size of the powder I want uh, without changing the viscosity of the uh, liquid I am using in my emulsion or in my uh, suspension. Uh, and I will only change the parameter of particle size, increasing it or decreasing it depending on the velocity, uh, 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 settling velocity I am looking for. Next, please. So the next part of the presentation, we will be talking about size me measurements methods. So, and we start with counting analysis. So we have the first one called electric sensing zone, uh, which is culture system, then followed by single particle optical sensing uh, SPOS, which is exactly the same uh, uh, like electric sensing, except that we are not using electric uh, field to, uh, uh, to uh, move the particles uh, through the fluid. However, we will be using a laser uh, source of light to measure uh, the size of particle and also count them. And we have uh, imagery uh, analysis. It can, be, it can be dynamic when the sample is in movement or static when the sample of powder is held in a sample holder. Next, please. The electric uh, sensing zone. Uh, in 1950, uh, um, Wallace Coulter uh, invented this equipment and the particles are uh, are moving uh, in uh, through an uh, electric field and they pass through an orifice here. If you can see the, uh, and, and the aperture, the particles uh, should pass through this aperture and the difference in or fluctuation in, uh, in uh, the heights of uh, pulses gives us uh, 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 an information about the size of the particles. So the particle size is determined by comparing the pulse uh, heights uh, to a standard curve we have made uh, previously before testing uh, uh, our powder using some standard uh, uh, references. But this technique is limited by the size of particles. We cannot uh, use it for larger particles. Uh, that's why uh, Dr. Nicoli David uh, say that, listen, we can measure the particle size using light instead of electricity. And we will talk about the single optical uh, sensing uh, methods. Next slide, please. In this uh, te technique, which is this, it has the same concept as culture system, we don't use electric uh, uh, field, but we uh, let uh, uh, particles in suspension uh, move in an area with uh, 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 stable and uh, illumination by a uh, laser. And the source of laser will uh, uh, pass th uh, through the suspension and then will help us to measure the particle, uh, uh, the particle size. We distinguish here two phenomena. Could you please go back to the slide, previous slide? We can have two phenomena, either light extinction called obstruct, uh, obscuration when the particle size is higher than 1.5 micrometer or uh, uh, the approach of light scattering when the particle is below 1.5 micrometers. Both approach are uh, 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 used in the same equipment. Next slide, please. So this uh, technique called or method called single particle optical sensing uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, is uh, specified by USP 788 and it must be used for injectable solution. 
for also emergency stabilities and uh, intravenous uh, uh, infusion. So it is a, a required technique to be applied in this kind of pharmaceutical processes because uh, we need to measure uh, uh, if there is uh, for solution injectable, we need to check if there is any particle, foreign particles in our injectable solution or infusion and make it's, it's included in the IPC in process control of the finished products after the mirage uh, uh, step. Uh, but for suspensions and emulsions, we can use it for counting and uh, particle size determination. Next slide, please. Uh, the extent, the, the two approaches for uh, single particle optical sensing as I explained, uh, could be either by extension, which is we measure the, the amount of light uh, obscured by the particle in the right side. But for finer particle below 1.5 micrometers, there is another physical phenomenon happening, which is the light scattering. So when the light hits the small particles, it gets scattered in different regions and there is a detector uh, measuring this uh, light scattered uh, to give us an idea about uh, the particle size. Both techniques, single particle optical sensing and uh, 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 electrical uh, op, uh, electrical particle sensing uh, can be, uh, results can be compared to a standard curve we have to make before uh, our routine test. Next slide. The both plots for both techniques, electric sensing and single particle optical sensing, uh, could be either uh, represented uh, such as a number of particles versus size, the, the first uh, uh, graph uh, on the top, or uh, by uh, uh, presenting volume weight number versus particle size. Uh, the, the 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 one in the bottom. Uh, we can also use it by using these techniques, both methods. We can also measure the concentration of particles in a range of uh, one million per uh, cubic centimeter. Next. The next uh, counting uh, methods, uh, it's image analysis. And we have two uh, kinds of image analysis, either dynamic one or static one. It's obvious from the uh, name of the method that uh, uh, for dynamic uh, image analysis, DIA, the particles or the powder sample is in movement. It could be uh, either for granules for, uh, falling, free falling, uh, there is a vibrator on the top of the equipment and it starts vibrating to let particles drop. Uh, or it could be uh, in air or liquid stream, uh, allowing dispersion of the particles in the fluid. So it, this method helps us to have a qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, analysis of the particles. So we can have the size, but also we can have an idea about the shape. And it concerns particles above one micrometers uh, to 135 millimeters. Um, it's excellent repeatability uh, and it can replace also the sieving, um, the sieving uh, method, which is a, a very standard uh, method we use in routine pharmaceutical uh, development and uh, processing. However, when particles are below one micrometer, we prefer to use laser diffraction method, which is the best choice for this uh, size. Uh, in this technique, uh, when powder flow, uh, either by air or liquid or by gravity uh, stream, there is a light coming uh, through from one side and we record only the shadow of the particles on a, on a screen. And this camera could uh, register between 30, 60, sorry, to 320 images per second. Uh, after that, there is a system, computerized system that will analyze the data and give us an idea about the particle size distribution. Measurement time is between one to five minutes. So it doesn't take a uh, long time compared to the sieving method we will see later on. Next, please. 
Uh, the dynamic, uh, as I said earlier, it's uh, it matches the sieve uh, results with the bonus to have an, inform an information about the uh, particle shape. It's it requires a short time uh, compared to the sieving process. Next, please. Next, please. As per the static image analysis. Uh, the sample is uh, put in um, uh, on a, a sample holder, and we have uh, two phases of the process: image acquisition and image uh, uh, detection. Uh, and the computer will calculate automatically uh, the uh, distribution of the particles and their size. We can also have an idea about the shape uh, for these uh, techniques. However, uh, uh, the detection limit is between 0 0.5 to uh, 1500 micrometers. Next. The difference between SIA, uh, uh, static uh, uh, image analysis, and uh, uh, dynamic uh, image analysis is that we use the SIA mainly in R&D applications. It can't be used in routine because um, it's kind of manual process and um, it concerns narrow distribution uh, uh, distribution of powders, but it's mainly used in R&D application. However, the dynamic one would be uh, the best and ideal routine measurement for bulk powders, uh, granules, uh, suspensions, even uh, even emulsions, if we want to to check the size of and form of uh, of the particles, uh, the quantity of the sample is higher uh, to use and is uh, a reliable and repeatable, uh, reproducible uh, technique. Okay. Next, please. Now we'll move to the uh, tradition tra traditional traditional uh, uh, technique, which is sieve analysis. It uh, it involves a, a, a fractioning of uh, a powder blend into several particle size uh, using sieves with different uh, mesh size, and we can calculate some. We can get some information. I will be uh, detailing in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. We will uh, we can get information like uh, uh, retained uh, weight of the particles and also the passing through uh, percentage of the particles. And we can uh, plot uh, uh, particle size distribution based on uh, uh, several information from each sieve. The equipment looks like this one in the photo, and it uh, helps to uh, analyze particle size from three micrometer to three millimeters. Uh, the powder could be uh, uh, I mean, uh, could be uh, streamed either by uh, gravity, by vibration, or by air or liquid. So it could be a dry process, wet or uh, dry or wet process uh, to analyze the powder blend. Next. So the information we uh, can uh, get from this analysis is based on the how much powder retained on each sieve with uh, 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 determined size. For example, in this case, we have a sample of, a sample of 385 grams. Uh, in the sieve number one, we uh, that has 2.8 millimeters uh, mesh size, uh, there was 100% of passing. And uh, uh, in the next one and th third one, the passing through the orifice gets selected more and more. So we measure the amount of the powder on the top of each sieve, and then we take this information in a table uh, like this one. From this information, we can deduct the percentage of weight retained. Uh, like uh, uh, we take uh, uh, the amount retained in one sieve, and we divide it by the total amount, total mass uh, of the sample. In this case, uh, for the sieve number two, we can uh, calculate it by dividing 35 grams of retained powder divided by 385. It will give us a 9.09 percent of weight retained in the sieve number two, and so on, until we get the details uh, for each sieve, and the total should be 100%. Uh, 
Uh, from this information, we could uh, calculate also the cumulative re retained uh, percentage, which is a sum, uh, summary of uh, uh, percentage of weight retained. For example, for the sieve number four, uh, the cumulative weight retained uh, equal 54.22%. That means that it's a summary of uh, 25.45 plus 19.74 plus, uh, plus 9.09%. And this information will help us to uh, uh, plot the information in a, a, a graph uh, representing the percentage of cumulative passing or retained mass in function of the particle size. And will give us an idea of the particle size distribution and we will have uh, better uh, vision about the population compo composing this powder. Next slide, please. So uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, get information either uh, like a histogram or like a curve if uh, we uh, select any parameter we want. Uh, for Q3, which is uh, uh, the cumulative percentage retained, uh, can give us this curve, but if we use the uh, the P3, which is concerned uh, the uh, amount of particles uh, uh, retained on each uh, on each uh, sieve, we will have this histogram. And from these uh, uh, plots, we can deduct what we call uh, percentile values D10, D50, and D90, and we can calculate a very important parameter called span, the span or also named distribution width which is D90 minus D10 divided by D50. And it gives us a number. Uh, based on this number, we can uh, uh, deduct and we can have an idea about if our product will have a good uh, 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 flowability or not. So with the, with the, with the, with the large, with large uh, histogram, uh, we will have large standard deviation and span. And that means we have uh, uh, several population in our in our particle uh, in our powder blend. Next slide, please. Ushra, next. Okay, uh, the next uh, part of uh, analysis method is called collective analysis. Uh, we will talk about dynamic uh, light scattering and laser diffraction. The first one is dynamic light scattering. Next, please. In the dynamic uh, uh, light scattering, we use the motion of the particles in a liquid. We call it Brownian motion, where in a liquid, the particles move differently than in uh, than streaming in air. The fine particles will move faster than, 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 than uh, large particles. And this, uh, this measurement requires a laser light which will be projected on uh, the suspension and there will be a scattering of uh, this uh, laser uh, depending on the size of the particles. So each size of particles has a diffusion speed uh, related to the size. And we will, the system will do uh, its calculation to uh, uh, give us an information, particle uh, size distribution of uh, light is monochromatic, it's laser. The range of the size uh, varies from 0 0.3 to uh, 10 micro, uh, 0 0.3 nanometer to 10 micrometers. It's suitable for nano uh, particles analysis, not for uh, uh, normal powders. And also we can use it to uh, uh, measure uh, molecular, macromolecular molecular, uh, uh, weight. 
uh, in solution, not in suspension. It help us. It can help us to measure the zeta potential and the concentration of the molecule. Next slide, please. So the principle is uh, very simple. Uh, we have a source of uh, laser that will hit a suspension of the particles. Uh, the suspension of particles, the particles will uh, scatter uh, uh, the uh, laser light to uh, reach uh, one detector. One specific information here, uh, because we will need it to compare it to laser diffraction in the next coming slide, is that the angle of uh, the angle of uh, scattering is fixed. It's we use only one uh, uh, fixed. Uh, uh, angle of scattering. So the detector will measure uh, the pulse heights uh, of the scattered lights and then collect the information to give us an idea about the particle size. Next, please. For DLS uh, scattering, uh, light scattering, we have two approaches. We call it either homodyne, uh, it's called uh, self beating, or uh, heterodyne, uh, reference beating. The uh, homodyne, uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, photo, uh, the light, the detector will measure only the scattered lights coming from the particles. And the peak or, or, or the pulse quality will not have uh, uh, a high resolution compared to the heterodyne uh, reference beating uh, approach that will, in the same time, measure the incident uh, uh, light or scattered light coming from the particle, but also the same uh, incident light coming from uh, the light source, uh, uh, making a kind of uh, signal amplification and increasing the quality of uh, the quality of uh, of the, the 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 pulse uh, registered in by by the detector. So. We can have both approach, but the best one require, uh, recommended is heterodyne to have a uh, better uh, uh, visibility on the quality of the resolution of the uh, analysis. Uh, this uh, uh, detector will uh, will register the uh, frequency of the coming scattered light. Uh, and as you can see in the mathematic formula, the frequency depends on the R, which is the radi radius of the particle. So by increasing the uh, uh, particle radius, the frequency will get uh, uh, lower and vice versa. Uh, and this will be analyzed with the system, computerized system, and we can draw uh, the particle size distribution plots. Next slide, please. Uh, I have to say, I, I, there, there are some missing slides here, but um, I, I will talk about them uh, even though. Uh, uh, we, with DL, two kinds of, of information. Either we can have a frequency power spectrum, it's uh, like this curve uh, called Lorentzian function where we can have a median uh, um, median frequency depending on the intensity of the scattered light. And from that, we can uh, deduct the particle size distribution. OK, next, please. As per uh, laser diffraction, it's kind of same principle. However, the difference is in the angle of uh, scattering. We don't, uh, the, the equipment doesn't measure uh, uh, the light scattered uh, uh, from one fixed angle. However, it measures all scattered angles uh, from the particles. For small particles, we have higher alpha, which is the sc scattered uh, uh, angle. For bigger uh, particles, we have a smaller angle. And uh, uh, it's inversely, uh, uh, inversely, uh, uh, proportional to the size of, uh, of the particles. And then the system could calculate uh, the particle size based on the angle measure, scattering angle measured from each particle size. So this uh, in this uh, equipment, we have uh, the particles streamed in air or in liquid, and uh, we have one monochromatic uh, source of light 
projected on the particles, uh, the particles will uh, reflect or diffract the uh, laser uh, light to the detector uh, at, at different uh, scattering angles uh, connected closely uh, uh, in relationship with the particle size. Uh, and we can uh, measure a range of particles between 0 0.01 micrometers to three millimeters. Okay, thanks. And next one, please. We get a plot like this one, uh, where we can uh, uh, determine uh, uh, manually the uh, percentile uh, values, D10, D50, and D90, and then we can uh, use them to um, explain the, the type of uh, the population we have in our powder. Next. The small angle X-ray uh, called scattering, it's called SACS, or it could be uh, uh, called XRD. It's uh, used for nanoparticle uh, analysis from one to 100 nanometers. Instead of projecting laser uh, light, we use X-ray light uh, with the uh, uh, X-ray uh, lamp. Uh, that will be uh, projected on the particles. And we measure the scattered uh, light coming from uh, the particles with the same uh, principle as laser diffraction, uh, diffraction uh, scattering analysis. The only difference is the particle size, the targeted particle size we want to measure. So XRD is mainly used for nanoparticles analysis. Okay, next one. Uh, the impact, uh, now we will uh, talk about the last part of my presentation, which is the impact of particle size on uh, powder, uh, powder flow. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So as you know that powders have a, a, a non-Newtonian fluid uh, behavior, like fluids, uh, and they have a plastic flow. So the forces like uh, Van der Waals, electrostatic forces, moisture content, and bulk density, they have a direct impact on the particle size, especially when uh, particle size is below 50 micrometers. Um, it's generally accepted that um, if we have uh, particles more than 1200 micrometers, we can have better flow. Uh, I mean, below 1200, we can have better flow. But above this uh, uh, value, we can have uh, uh, problems in flow which is due to the mechanical blockage. Next slide, please. Uh, to have uh, to uh, express the flowability of a powder, we can use, for example, and there are so many different uh, tests that we can use. So we can use the angle of repose, having this avalanche of powder when the uh, powder mountain is large occupying a big surface with the angle of repose below 30 degree, we can, uh, uh, the, I mean, we can say that our powder blend is, uh, has a good flowability. However, if the mountain gets uh, vertical with higher angle of repose above uh, 35 degree, then the powder flowability will be a concern. And a formulator should fix this issue before moving to the next step either by uh, changing the particle size distribution by agglomeration or by uh, mainly by agglomeration or by uh, spray drying to improve the flowability of the powder blend. Next step, please. The segregation, as I said, I said earlier, it's a, a phenomenon that we cannot avoid. Uh, even our powder flowability is good, particle size distribution is homogeneous but it's something we can reduce only. Uh, in case we have uh, uh, particle size distributions uh, with large uh, with more fines and more cores, it's uh, time for formulator to uh, uh, make it uh, narrower either by uh, uh, agglomeration or uh, roller compaction process to improve the flowability of the particles. Next one. The flowability and segregation issues could have an impact, uh, and particle size also will have an impact on uh, content uniformity. In these uh, three cases, you have uh, three groups of powder, same uh, API, but with uh, different particle size. 
The first group in the left, we have a particle size distribution uh, with a mean uh, diameter below 211 micrometers. As you can see, after two minutes of blending, we could have a content uniformity in different uh, uh, locations of the mixer at two at different time. But at two minutes, we could achieve the uh, uh, content uniformity. However, by increasing the particle size in this case only, we needed at least eight minutes to uh, uh, achieve uh, the, uh, our content uniformity. Between these two uh, extreme extremity of, of powder size, we could need four minutes to uh, uh, achieve uh, particle, I mean, content uniformity of the powder. So uh, this is to tell you that during formulation stage, we should select different ranges of particle size distribution and check the content uniformity in our uh, lab scale uh, before we move to the uh, uh, pilot scale or uh, uh, commercial scale. Uh, here where the cost of uh, correcting the mistake will be very higher. So it's important to check the particle size distribution at this stage and decide which particle size distribution is optimal for me to get a shorter process and uh, to achieve our uh, my my uh, content uniformity in the short time. Next one, please. Uh, all these uh, events, I mean, flowability, content uniformity, uh, uh, segregation, particle size, will have an impact on uh, dissolution rate and solubility characteristics of mainly of the drug. And it's only uh, uh, related to poorly soluble APIs. When we talk about highly soluble APIs, particle size uh, really doesn't have an impact on uh, uh, dissolution rate or uh, uh, bioavailability. But in this case, uh, we should have more uh, focus on uh, poorly soluble APIs where we can improve the dissolution rate by uh, decreasing the particle size and carefully decreasing the particle size without affecting flowability and content uniformity. The uh, noise and witness equation could uh, uh, can give us a, a clear explanation of the link between specific surface area, uh, uh, dissolution rate, and uh, indirectly with the particle size. Next one, please. So this is all from my side. Uh, uh, I hope it's not a boring presentation. I know it is. Uh, 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 it has some theoretical parts, but uh, I had to explain it for everybody. I know there are experts here among us, but there are also students who need to learn from this presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your attending. Thank you so much, uh, Karim, for your uh... Very interesting presentation and uh, what I really enjoy it. Uh, and I am sure that uh, all the, our attendees would agree that you have uh, give uh, a good overview of uh, particle size distribution measurements and uh, the importance of this uh, parameter for uh, the drug formulation of the different dosage forms and also the relationship between particle size and bioavailability. So thank you very much for your very important presentation. And uh, it's also now my great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker for today from Germany, Dr. Udo uh, Schlem. Dr. Udo Schlem works in the R&D department um, of the company Twest Electronic in Hamburg since 2001. Uh, he is responsible for the development of microwave sensors, new applications, and takes care of the company's uh, patents. So he studied physics uh, at the University of Hamburg and earned his uh, PhD, Doctor of Engineering, at the Hamburg uh, University of Technology. So we are very happy to welcome you here, uh, Dr. Udu. Welcome to the call. Lovely to have you. And the microphone is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Usha, for the introduction. And uh, 
thanks everyone for taking part in this uh, this presentation. And um, yeah, I'm very amazed that there are part participants from all of the, over the world uh, taking part in this event. Uh, so I now, now will introduce the measuring technique that measures uh, on one hand uh, the moisture content in laboratory and process, uh, but it's also uh, suitable to measure parameters like density, bulk density, the mass, or uh, even the particle size. Uh, and uh, this is a microwave measuring technique. So uh, yeah, can we go to the first slide, please? Yes, I will show you a short overview of a inline uh, moisture measuring methods using electromagnetic waves. Uh, then I will introduce you to the basics of the microwave resonator technique. In the following, I will show you a, a sh very short overview of a, a pharmaceutical continuous, bat uh, continuous production and batch production. And uh, in the following, I will show you examples for pharmaceutical application in the different stages of production in continuous and also batch production processes. Next slide, please. So microwaves are part of, a, of the spectrum of electromagnetic, the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, the electromagnetic waves are characterized uh, by their frequency and their wavelength. And of course, you know that the uh, wavelength and frequency depend inversely on each other. That means a short wavelength means a high frequency, for example. And uh, their uh, electromagnetic waves are often used to measure the moisture, material moisture content in different uh, parts of the spectrum. So at a, a low uh, frequency, we got uh, in the radio frequencies, uh, we got a capacitive measurement. Uh, at a higher frequency, we got this microwave measurement. And at high frequencies, we get an infrared measurement. Next slide, please. So first, uh, I'm talking about a capacitive measurement. We got a long wavelength from meters to several hundred meters, means uh, frequencies of uh, megahertz or even kilohertz. Uh, so you can do a fast moisture measurement using these electromagnetic waves in this spectrum, but uh, we can measure more moisture only measure one parameter in this uh, frequency range. We can measure more or less a polarization of the matter uh, in the external field, but the attenuation is influenced by uh, by uh, by conductivity by salts. We could, because salt and minerals can uh, can move in the in the external field in this frequency range. So we're measuring only one material parameter. So precise moisture measurement is only possible if the amount of material that's situated in the measuring field stays constant. It means we can only have a, have a precise measurement uh, if, if uh, density and mass in the measuring field does not change. Uh, next slide, please. The next well-known method is a, a infrared, measure, uh, infrared measurement. Uh, so we are working at high frequencies and the wavelength is only nanometers. And uh, the, the penetration depth of the electromagnetic waves into matter is related uh, to the frequency. So this uh, infrared measurement is a surface measurement and cannot penetrate deeply into the matter. And the, the color and the structure of the material under test can influence the measurement. So it's a, it's a surface measurement and in, in uh, practice, it shows that it's rather complex to calibrate. Next slide, please. Yeah, now we're coming to uh, the microwave measurement where microwave uh, uses, in our case, centimeter waves. Uh, we are measuring, can measure two parameters at a time. Uh, and these, these two parameters, material parameters, are related to the two parts of the permittivity of the material under test. And the, the permittivity is a complex uh, number. And uh, the first, uh, the real part, uh, describes the shortening of the wavelengths or the polarization of the matter in an external electromagnetic field. And the second part uh, describes 
uh, attenuation or the the conversation of, of uh, microwave energy into other forms of energy, for example, heat. Uh, so this is a, uh, the permittivity is a good uh, parameter to measure the moisture content because there's a big difference of the permittivity of water and dry matter. And this is because of the uh, the structure of the of the water and uh, the dipole structure. The dipoles can be turned in the external measuring field. And so the permittivity in this frequency range we use for the measurement is quite high. Next slide, please. So what we are doing in our me microwave measuring systems as we generate a microwave in a certain certain range of frequency. This Microwave is coupled into the applicator, so-called resonator, by a small antenna. By a small, the second small antenna, the transmission of the microwaves through this sensor, through this resonator, is measured uh, and turned from the from the in a, by a detector diode into a voltage. Uh, the next slide, please. So the microwave resonator can look very different ways. We will see some examples in the following, but it's, uh, it's an object uh, that got several resonance modes, different resonance frequencies. That means at certain frequencies, uh, there's a maximum of max microwave transmission uh, through this structure. And at these resonance modes, a uh, standing wave can exist inside this resonance structure. Uh, these resonance frequencies depend on the, on the physical dimensions of the resonator. I will show you in the following also. And for most of the applications, only one of the resonance modes is used. Next slide, please. Now, uh, first, this uh, most uh, simple structure is a, a so-called uh, cylindrical hollow cavity resonator. This is just uh, a hollow metal cylinder. Uh, crossed uh, along the cylinder axis by a tube. And we, you can insert the material under test in this measuring tube. Uh, now I told you that uh, the, the resonance modes or resonance frequencies depend on certain, on certain uh, physical dimensions of the resonator. And uh, the most important dimension of this resonator is the diameter because uh, it's related to the resonance modes mostly used for measurement. And so the, the, the first uh, resonance mode, the basic resonance mode that is used for measurement means half a wavelength fits into the diameter of this cylinder. Uh, so we got a, a field that is strong in the, in the position of the tube and this has a circular symmetry and it behaves a bit like a drum head. A drum head that's fixed at the rim and had maximal elongation in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there's a second uh, family of resonators, the so-called stray field resonators. Uh, in hollow cavity resonators, the, the measuring field is uh, placed inside a closed metal housing. On, uh, and uh, for stray field resonators, uh, the measuring field uh, is generated that is bound to a surface to a surface uh, where the, the material under test passes the sensor. So these sensors mostly are used in process measurement. On the left-hand side, we see a so-called planar sensor. This is a, has a, has a ceramical surface uh, with a diameter of about 16 centimeters where the, the material under test passes, for example, at the connection points between uh, conveyor belts. On the right-hand side, this is so-called coaxial sensor. A coaxial sensor is a, sh a short, uh, a shortcut coaxial line used, uh, that can be used as a resonator. And the measuring field is uh, quite small. You see on, on top of this sensor, the measuring field has a diameter of about one centimeter. The, this sensor can be built very, in a very small way. And this, exactly this structure uh, is used uh, in fluid bed drying also in, in, in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Now, I told you what we are doing. We're using such a resonator, a sensor, and we are generating uh, a microwave in a certain range of frequency that fits this uh, resonance modes we want to use for measurement. We are measuring the so-called resonance curve. You see in this, in this picture, this resonance curve is uh, characterized by two parameters. One is the resonance frequency itself, the second one is the width of this curve. The half width means the width of the curve that have amplitude. Now get the next slide, please. So when a material is placed inside the resonator or onto a resonator, the characteristics of this resonance curve change. The first effect is the resonance frequency decreases. And this is due to a decrease of the wavelengths inside the material under test. Because, of course, the wavelengths inside the material is always shorter than the wavelengths in air. So this is uh, these two, two parameters are di di directly, these two changes are directly related to the permittivity of the material under test. So the, the decrease of the resonance frequency is related to the polarization uh, of the matter and or the shortening of the wavelengths. And uh, the second effect is the half width of the resonance curve increases. The curve gets wider. And this is due, uh, this effect is related to the imaginary part of the permittivity means in this case, this is related to the microwave oven effect, transformation of microwave energy into heat. But we are not heating up the material under test because we are working at powers of about 10 milliwatt. And for example, your cell phone has a working in a, in a quite similar uh, frequency range and has, uh, has a power of uh, maybe two watt or so. So we are not heating up the, this, uh, the, the, the sample, but uh, we're using the yeah, microwave oven effect. Can I get the next slide, please? So you see here what, what happens to the resonance curves. On the right-hand side, we got the, the empty applicator, the sharp curve, uh, at high frequency, and uh, on the left-hand side, you see the, the resonance curves shifted, widened in different uh, states of filling. Can I get the next slide, please? Yes. Yeah, so during the measurement, th these two changes are detected. Our measuring values are the shift of the resonance frequency, in the, uh, we call A, and the increase of the half width of the resonance curve, we call B. So these two effects are related on the amount of material situated in the measuring field. So if you fill up the resonator, the curve gets shifted more and more and gets broader and broader. But these two parameters depend on the, on the amount of material in the same way. That means the quotient of these two parameters is independent of the, of the amount of material in the measuring field. So it's independent of mass and density. It only depends on the moisture content of, of the measured material. So it's, it's, uh, that's the reason that it's uh, possible to measure the, the moisture content of a material under test independent of mass and density. And we're measuring two parameters of the material under test and can calculate out of this two unknown material parameters. And this is normally the moisture content. And for small objects, we can measure the mass, for example, pharmaceutical capsules and tablets, or we can measure the density of a, a bulk density of a bulk material. Now, next slide, please. Now, we come into uh, I will show you some examples for the application of the microwave measurement in the, in the, the pharmaceutical production processes. And uh, I will give you a short overview first over the classical pharmaceutical production means a uh, batch production. And uh, in the following also the newer, newer approach, the continuous production. Both, uh, both concepts consist more or less on the, on the same steps, the same uh, steps of, of production, but uh, of course, uh, in, a, in a quite different way. So we get in, a, in the first step, batch production process is first 
dispensing and blending, then it's granulation and drying. Then if you want to produce tablets, we got tableting, coating of the tablets, and uh, you can, the, the, uh, the product is a coated tablets that can be packed and uh, shipped, sold. So in general, large equipment is needed because normally uh, you use a, a big, you produce a lot, big amount of material. And uh, often manufacturing and analysis are done in several sites. So the, the production is stopped after each step and the material is analyzed in, a, in laboratory measurements. So the ma manufacturing process takes uh, week, weeks to months to get a finished product. Can I get the next slide, please? So this is different in continuous production. In continuous production, you've got the same steps, feeding, blending, granulation, drying, and so on. But uh, a small equipment is needed, and uh, the, the several devices uh, could work after different principles. Uh, normally, larger, uh, much, much lower amounts of material uh, are manufactured at the same time, and uh, but manufacturing and analysis are done in one site, and the manufacturing process takes uh, only hours to uh, days to be finished. So in this in this case, it's uh, it's uh, mandatory to uh, to apply PAT technology to control the process and the the the, the quality of the of the product. Can I get the next slide, please? So I will uh, go through these processes step by step and show you what we can do with this microwave measurement. Uh, in the first step in continuous and batch production, in feeding and blending, a moisture measurement uh, is possible. And at the same time, we can measure the bulk density of the product. Next slide, please. I'm coming to the granulation phase. Uh, most of the time, the in the continuous production, uh, the the moisture and, and den density product is possible at the outlet of a, of a for example of a screw screw granu granulator that is often taken uh, for granulation in this continuous line. Uh, in continuous production, usually granulation and drying takes place in different uh, sections of the process. In batch put, uh, pro production, often granulation is drying and that is done in the same device. Uh, so the microwave measure measurement is uh, performed directly in the fluid bed. So it's possible to measure the moisture content. And uh, I can also show you examples for the measurement of bulk density and the particle size distri distribution has been tested. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the drying phase. In, in continuous production, you usually have, uh, have dryers that uh, consist of several small drying cells. And uh, so the microwave measurement has to be placed at the outlet of the dryer. So it's well established to measure the moisture content there, uh, but it's also possible to measure the bulk density and the uh, particle size information at this point of the process. In batch, produ uh, batch production, I, or, or, or I already said that uh, granulation is drying often in the, in the same device. And uh, so it's well it's established to measure the moisture content in fluid bed drying. And exactly, especially the endpoint of drying can be measured with very high precision. Uh, but the measurement of bulk density and particle size has also been tested successfully. And I will show you some measurements in the, in the following. Next slide, please. On this uh, slide, we see on the right-hand side, the so-called coaxial resonator I've uh, shown you uh, formally. And uh, on the left hand side, you see this uh, sensor is mounted uh, to a fluid bed uh, device. Next slide. So here we see some test measurements. The, the solid lines are the measurements uh, of the microwave. And we are, have to use uh, just a lactose every cell mixture for this test measurement. Uh, this is a drying process. 
and you see uh, in the the, the plots uh, the the dots are the reference uh, ref reference samples taken uh, periodically out of this drying process. You see this. Uh, these values are really in good accordance and uh, looking very similar. Next slide, please. Oh, here you can see some measurements in granulation and drying phase. Again, in, in blue, we got the, the, the uh, microwave measurement and in uh, orange, we got uh, the reference values. This is a mixture bit of cell lactocellulose and uh, paracetamol. This uh, example. Next slide, please. Uh, this can be also done for the LOD value, not the moisture value, the LOD value, uh, when you uh, use processes with solvents. In this case, you can see a process with 100% isopropanol, lactose avicel mixture. Next slide, please. In continuous production, <clears throat> you see uh, in near the, the blue device, the small, there's a, the sensor mounted at the uh, at the outlet of the dryer. Uh, and uh, yeah, can you can go to the next slide again, please. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, it's possible. On one hand, it's possible to separate well-dried material from uh, wrong. 40 dried material and sort out uh, the wrong material. And on the other hand, it's uh, possible to regulate the airflow by use of the dryer, uh, by use of the microwave measuring signals. Can I get the next slide already? Yes. This is just an example. This is uh, uh, the menu the, of, the, of the software of the microwave measuring devices. And this is a calibration curve for lactose. Again, next slide, one more time. So we are measuring two microwave measuring values, A and B, shift of the resonance frequency and widening of the resonance curve. And uh, these, I told you, these single values depend on the, on the amount of material in the, in the measuring field. In this case, it's, uh, the, it's where in, in fluid bed drying or in fluid bed uh, devices related to the density of the floating material. So by re respecting the inlet air quantity and the fill quantity of the dryer, uh, the bulk density of the material uh, can be calculated. Can I get the next slide, please? So you see here the reference values and the microwave measuring values of the bulk density of again, a mixture of lactose and cellulose. And you see, it's uh, even if uh, the, the 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 material was measured in floating, uh, we can measure the the bulk density with a quite high precision. Next slide, please. This is a uh, this this was a me test measurement in uh, in, uh, in in batch production. And the next slide shows uh, an example in continuous production at the measure at the end of the of the dryer. And you see this uh, measurement of, of bulk density is also possible. Uh, it's also possible in continuous production. Of course, we don't have to respect the inlet air quantity. Next slide. Now, uh, coming to a particle size measurement that is quite a, still an R&D project. So if the density uh, of the material in the test uh, depends on the particle size, we can measure an average particle size uh, in a fluid bed dryer or in a fluid bed device. Uh, and the parameters for calibration is on one hand, the microwave measuring values A and B, the product temperature, again, the inlet air quantity and the fill quantity, because these parameters influence the, the density of the material floating in the in a fluid bed machine. Uh, can I get the next slide? So I will show you some test uh, measurements of placebo material and uh, some measuring examples for the two parameters of fineness that Dr. Karim also introduced. It's a, a fineness of the particles dependent on the size 
of the material of, of the pair of the uh, of the particles and the x3 is uh, the distribution of uh, depending on the volume uh, of the particles can i get the next slide so you've seen here uh, several curves for the x010 uh, and x050 and 90 curves uh, on the one hand, uh, measured with the optical inline laser system, and on other hand, uh, with our microwave system. These curves are also looking quite uh, similar. Yeah, can I get uh, the next slide, please? This is the same, the same measurement, same measurement, uh, same processes. Now we are looking for the for the parameters of fineness related to the volume. So the X3 value, you see also in, uh, in, in, in both cases, the laser and the microwave system uh, giving quite uh, similar results. Can I get the next uh, slide, please? So also in continuous production, uh, we can do these measurements. And uh, here we calibrate uh, for the microwave measuring values, uh, product temperature, and also for liquid addition are used for calculating these uh, parameters. Can I get, a, get the next slide? Yeah. Uh, so you see, there's also a good result. And uh, in this case, uh, was sieving was a... Uh, the, 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 uh, the reference values were achieved by sieving the material. Okay, can I get uh, the next slide? I want to have uh, some remarks. This particle size distribution measurement with microwave is really a, an R&D project and the stability of the calibrations has to be tested. And uh, also it's necessary to compare uh, uh, combinate uh, some process parameters uh, with the microwave measuring values. But if you do a moisture measurement, uh, anyway, in, in your fluid bed device and your fluid bed dryer, then you can get some information about the particle size uh, at the same time. That's very nice. Next uh, step, please. So we're a bit. Uh, we're coming to the next step of production, uh, tabletting. So moisture and density measurement of the granules uh, can be done in the inlet of the tablet press. And there's a, a patent uh, filed by the company FETE, you know, well-known uh, well -known producer of tabletting machines that was uh, done, uh, filed in, in, in with, uh, yeah, with inventors from both companies several years ago. Next step, please. Uh, in coating, we have only uh, experience with add line measurements to so take single tablets out of the coating process and measure them near the, the device. Uh, we are not sure at the moment if it's possible to mount a microwave data sensor inside a drum coater for online measurement because uh, the, the microwave sensor may not be sprayed with a, with a uh, coating solvent. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, we're just in a hurry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what can be done with a, with measurement uh, is a fast mass measurement of tablets and capsules because our fastest device is measuring for forty thousand times at a, in a second, and uh, so we can. Uh, but. There's a speed limit for the mass measurement of, of capsules and tablets because these uh, objects have to be separated and then transported separately through the resonator. And uh, so we are using this so-called 3D technique. Can you can I get the next slide, please? It's a special resonator. We're generating three resonance modes at a time perpendicular to each other, measuring the tablets floating. And uh, yeah, that increases precision of the mass measurement. Next slide, please. So we got a partner company called Pharma Technology from Belgium, and they uh, they developed this uh, this control device for fast measurement of tablets and capsules.
measuring the mass can measure the moisture content at the same time. And uh, also an in, uh, infrared system is integrated to measure the ingredients, the percentage of the ingredients of tablets, for example. And uh, they measure measuring at the speed of 35 objects per second. Next slide, please. And uh, the accuracy of the measurement is a three sigma for the mass measurement of tablets is one milligram. And uh, if you measure empty capsules, then you come to a standard deviation of about 0 0.1 milligram in this region. Next slide again. These uh, were just two old uh, measurements with this uh, for this mass measurement. We got empty capsules, the standard deviation about zero, in this case, 0 0.17. Next slide, please. And. Uh, this is a, the, the tablets with a mass of 330 milligram and with a standard deviation of 0 0.4 milligram. Next slide, please. Yeah, one more time. Yes, I want to say, and I think I sh have shown you that there are many apl applica possible applications for the moisture, my density, or mass measurement uh, in the pharmaceutical production process. And all these uh, measurements can also be done uh, in laboratory easily. And uh, just last slide, just a in short information. Thieves, our company is uh, situated in Hamburg. It's a family uh, company. And uh, we had got a lot of experience in developing and, uh, of course, selling uh, microwave measuring value, uh, devices. And uh, these devices are applied in very various uh, industries. So in pharmaceutical industry, also in tobacco industry a lot, uh, chemistry, food and feed, and so on. And uh, so we're working worldwide. OK. I uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I think a bit uh, time for, for some questions is there. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Karim and Mr. Udo for delivering this webinar. Um, so yes, during the presentation, we received uh, some of the questions. Um, Mr. Karim uh, kindly answered a lot of them offline in the Q&A box. So in case uh, somebody has a last minute question, feel free to leave it in the Q&A box. Um, the, one of the questions that was left was, uh, how can we determine the RI of the API particle? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, RI means uh, refractive index. So they can use uh, simply the laser diffraction uh, equipment to measure the refractive index for the API or even for the excipients. Both uh, for me are similar. Uh, just use laser diffraction. OK. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, so those were all the uh, questions that we uh, received uh, in the past few minutes. As mentioned, uh, Dr. Karim answered uh, the rest of line. So of course, in, in case uh, some of the uh, attendees have additional questions, you can always uh, reach out to our speakers uh, at um, by sending them an email to the addresses which you were able to find at the beginning of the webinar when we introduced the speakers. Um, we also received a question regarding the certificates, and yes, uh, everybody will receive the uh, uh, attendance certificate uh, via the email from FIP. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Butra? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Yes, Nicolina, you can go ahead. Um, yes, so uh, thank you very much again to everybody who uh, attended the webinar and who will uh, see the recording of the 
uh, webinar uh, online. As a reminder, it will be uploaded on the uh, events.fib.org website. Uh, so thank you very much to our guest speakers and uh, co-moderator and uh, have a great uh, rest of the day, everyone. Thank you Thanks. and uh, Thanks, goodbye. Guys. Oh, yeah, yes, thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs>